I'm going to remain seated, uh, and we're going to really make this informal. I'll speak briefly a little bit about what I was trying to do in this book, then we'll have a discussion with Ryan and then with everyone else. Thanks so much, uh, Lisa and Neil and everyone at SIGU and 3CT and the bookstore, of course. Uh, I, I, I'm I have to remember that I'm not leaving here without a copy of history and class consciousness. I hope you have one. I need it desperately. OK. <laughs> um, so cannibal capitalism. Um, I think I should start by um, quoting one of my favorite lines from Marx, which I quote uh, often. Uh, it's about what critical theory is. He says in an early manuscript, it's the self-clarification of the struggles and wishes of the age. And I've always liked that as a definition. So what should critical theory look like in our age? Number one, it's got to be a critical theory of capitalism. For too long, that word was you know, sort of banished, a kind of embarrassment. Some, a few dinosaur diehards would still whisper it in alleyways. But, but basically, it was not a respectable subject. Fortunately, that is no longer the case. And uh, the reason why I think, um, well, there are several, but the, the one that's front and center on my mind now is the sense that we are in a, a big hot mess, a situation that can't really be understood if we stick to the idea that there's this discrete problem over here and this other one over there and then this one and that one. Oh, and by the way, there's this discrete social movement over here and this one over there and they're all trying to right these various discrete wrongs. No, it's, it, it can't just be a coincidence that the planet is burning up at the same time that police are murdering black men and women in the streets at the same time that people are running from job to job, little jobs, right, trying to sort of figure out how to take care of their families, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. That, that, that you know, democracy is in a, a major uh, crisis. The, the, this is not a coincidence. There is something in the social system that underlies all of this. That is my firm conviction. And uh, that's really why I started um, thinking seriously again about capitalism in the last few years. Now, what I discovered very quickly was that we really needed to think about it in a different way. I started out by quoting Marx, and I'm happy to say that in some sense or another, I'm a Marxist. Uh, I'm not embarrassed at all to, to say that. But everything is packed into that in some sense or another. And um, my idea is, uh, and we can argue about whether this is faithful or unfaithful to Marx. I don't want to get into that right now. But in any case, the idea that capitalism is an economic system, pure and simple, seems to me to be the problem. I'm not saying that Marx actually believed that, but somehow uh, all sorts of people came to believe that, including those within what our dear friend Moish Postone would have called traditional Marxism. So capitalism is something bigger than an economy. If a critical theory of capitalism is going to illuminate our crisis, and it is a crisis in my view, and it's what historians would call a general crisis. It's not sectoral. It's not in this domain and in that domain and, and so on. But it's all together. All, it, it, it has many strands, but they are mutually entangled and are exacerbating one another. If we want a critical theory of that illuminates all of that, then we have to think about capitalism in an enlarged, expanded way. It's not just an economic system, but it's about a society, I call it an institutionalized social order, that sets up a perverse, contradictory, and deeply destructive relation between its economy and a whole set of seemingly non-economic 
institutions. It's about the relation between the factory and the family, or production and social reproduction. One of these counts as official, monetized, economic. The other is some sort of a, a background uh, for that, which supplies some important inputs for the economy, but is itself not thoroughly monetized, marketized, commodified. What does it supply the family? It supplies that essential commodity, labor power, but not by paying people to produce labor power, by getting them to do it for love and a whole bunch of other reasons. Okay, so that's one essential non-economic precondition for a capitalist economy. Another is nature. Now we come to the the ecological problematic, uh, not just uh, you know, the sort of material inputs to production, the energy that powers industrial machinery, not just the foodstuffs that power human labor, or for that matter, animal labor, uh, but also the general conditions that if they're not in place, nothing happens. Breathable air, potable water, fertile soil, a climate in, in which we can live a reasonably stable uh, existence. All of this, these are still further necessary background conditions, as I call them, for the economic foreground of capitalism. It doesn't work without them. The system, the economy, you could say, needs them. And yet, as with care work, which I spoke about a minute ago, the, the economic part of the system is primed to free ride on those things, to scarf up, to take what it needs without giving a damn about replenishing what it takes or repairing what it damages. It's just all there, uh, you know, supposedly. So this is what I mean by a perverse, contradictory, destructive relation. The same is true for a third precondition for a capitalist economy, and that is public power, legal systems, infrastructure of all kinds, um, uh, regulatory apparatuses, all of that, broadband, I mean, you name it, all of that that we know the market is unable to provide in the form of for-profit commodities, even though more and more in this country, at least, we try to do it that way. So. Public power is a necessary condition for a capitalist economy. And yet here too, the capitalist class doesn't want to pay for it. it. It helps itself to all the goods it can provide and yet is constantly trying to evade it, offshoring its operations, put, dumping its money in tax havens, uh, lobbying, capturing regulatory agencies through lobbying and, uh, and other means. So we have a tendency to hollow out the very public powers that the society needs, that capital needs in one sense, but more importantly, that we need. So another perverse, contradictory, and now I'll finally use the word cannibalistic uh, relationship between the economy and its background conditions of possibility. I will mention uh, one more. And that is, I believe that you, you don't have the exploitation of free workers, which Marxist theory tells us produces surplus value, which is the end all and be all for a capitalist, supposedly. Actually, I think it's really profit rather than surplus value, but that's another story. Um, you don't have the, 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 the uh, successful, profitable exploitation of free labor if you don't also have somewhere disavowed in the background, hidden away, a lot of unfree, dependent, or semi-free labor that is uh, not, with whom the niceties of contract and law are not operative. Uh, coerced labor coerced in one way or another. And this uh, overlaps historically and today with racialized labor, right? With a, what I have recently taken to calling subwork, 
de degraded, disrespected, ill-treated, uh, you know, dirty, dangerous, ill-paid work. So there's a, that's a fourth necessary condition for the, the, the magic of capital accumulation with, for what is sometimes called capital's self-expansion. Of course, everything that I've just said shows you that it's not self-expansion. It's expansion that depends upon cannibalizing sources of wealth that are not officially counted as economic, that don't appear on the balance sheets of the corporate sector or in um, at least the way they used to construct the UN statistics. Uh, nowadays, I think they've all adopted some of them are just sends ideas and maybe other things are included there. But um, this is what I mean by cannibal capitalism. And what I've been describing, it's a recipe for big trouble. And that's not to say that we're always in big trouble. I actually think that the kind of crisis we are facing now is relatively rare in the history of capitalism. There may have been the last one of this magnitude was in the 1920s, 1930s, this Great Depression. Uh, you know, maybe there have been four, most five such crises in the history of capitalism where all of the efforts to diffuse the contradictions, to soften the tensions, often by displacing trouble elsewhere onto regions or populations that are uh, considered, you know, un unimportant, uh, you know, not, uh, not powerful enough to cause trouble, basically. Populations that have been deprived of political clout or self-defense, <laughs> we, can, we can push all the, the trouble onto them. So um, there are ways of diffusing these crises in normal times. But as I say, I don't think this is a normal time. And I think that what I've been describing is a kind of, you could call it an objective structural crisis where the previous regime that was supposed to patch up the trouble has, is, is in tatters, has, has dissolved, there isn't yet on the horizon a credible successor project, one that can command uh, widespread support, which would be necessary uh, for a transition that is not just a complete, you know, um, armed uh, takeover. Um, and so this is not just a structural crisis, but a, but a hegemonic crisis. The neoliberalism really isn't, it, its ideology is no longer credible. The idea that if we just get rid of the governmental red tape and, and just marketize everything, it will all work. No one believes that anymore, except maybe for you know a few people in Silicon Valley. But um, the problem is, it, it, this is a moment in which people are really looking for alternatives. And because the, the sort of narratives, the framings and interpretations that normally contain dissent, marginalize, you know, very radical dissent, keep us arguing on the basis of supposedly shared con consensual, you know, underpinnings, because that's all gone. People are contemplating out-of-the-box ideas, some of which are god-awful. And um, now I come to sort of the political fallout of all this. It's often thought that in order to counter the god-awful, we need to close ranks, drop the most radical, egalitarian, system-transforming ideas, defend liberalism against fascism, et cetera, et cetera. There may be a moment when that is necessary. When, when the moment comes, I'll be there on the barricades. But I don't think that's the moment now. I think this is the moment to really try to construct 
a truly transformative project that will lay to rest this cannibalizing dynamic once and for all. I, I don't see how we can actually address the climate crisis, actually address the care crisis, the crisis of democracy, the crisis of racial injustice and imperialism. I don't see how we can actually um, do all of that if we don't take a hard look and are not willing to contemplate transforming this underlying structure that I'm claiming is driving all of that. Um, so um, how can we imagine a society that does not basically put nature, families, public powers and, and all the rest, that doesn't just serve it up on a meal to these guys and say, yeah, just, just feast on it and, and, and feast on us while you're at it. And, you know. how, ca how can we reimagine uh, society? I, I'm happy to say that I'm a democratic socialist, but you know, I, I, it, that's another word that's thrown a around a great deal these days and I'm glad for it, but I don't think we have a lot of clarity about what it means. And I will close with one last thought, this is not by any means satisfy the idea of clarity about what it means. But my one thought is we have to figure out how to have a system that involves something like pay as you go, no free riding, no displacing unpaid costs on others, including on future generations. We have to develop non-antagonistic relations between whatever we're going to produce, which we are going to need to in the, in the way of, of use values and, and, and so on, all the things we need, uh, non-antagonistic relation between that activity and the ecological reproduction of the planet on the one hand, the social reproduction of human beings on the other, the reproduction and, uh, of, of public capacities to coordinate everything, we must have public powers. I'm against anarchism, even though I'm teaching a course on it now. And I'm learning a lot, actually, but still. <laughs> um, uh, so this is, this is, the book is a diagnosis of this beast, which I'm calling cannibal capitalism. Again, bigger than an economy, a perverse relation between the economic and the quote unquote non-economic, and an attempt to connect the dots to, to, to show how we might begin to understand so, at least some of the relations between the ecological strand of the crisis, the racial justice stand, strand of the crisis, the social reproduction strand of the crisis, the political strand of the crisis. And I think it's important to have a way of connecting those dots in the last analysis, because how else are we going to, how else are we going to understand who are our allies in a struggle to transform this structure? Who are our allies and who are our enemies? And if we are not clear about that, we will be drawn as alas, many progressive forces have been into the past, in the past, into unholy alliance with you know, cosmopolitan, forward-thinking neoliberals who are supposedly pro-feminist, pro-LGBTQ, pro-environment, and, and all the rest. Um, all right, so can, Cannibal Capitalism is a proposal, this book, for how to connect the dots in the hope of satisfying that Marx idea that I started with providing at least some of the self-clarification of the struggles and wishes of the age. Thank you.
Well, good evening, everyone. I think it's my turn at the mic. Um, I want to thank the organizers um, of today's event. I want to thank the seminary co-op. It's a lot of fun to be on this side of the room. I've been in, in the crowd many times over. This is really the best of you, Chicago, if I do say so myself. I also want to thank 3CT, and especially our guest, Nancy, um, you know, for inviting me to participate in this vibrant and very timely forum on cannibal capitalism. And I just wanted to say also, I'm in awe of how sort of the, the clarity of your remarks just now. And I hope that, if anything, my comments here will provoke even more brilliance out of you, Nancy. So that's my task here. And I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief, um, but I want to sketch out the terrain of like two broad questions that I'll bring in at the end on matters of politics and audience that I think you've touched on a bit already. Um, but this relates to this analytic of cannibal capitalism as well as cannibalization, which is another term that Nancy uses in the book. And what I think is striking about this contribution, especially today, is how familiar and timely it rings. You know, we see this especially in your epilogue where you take us on this detour through the recent history of our present. You know, overdetermined by a viral pandemic, um, the ongoing cannibalization of nature, the willful retreat of social welfare and care work in service of this primal drive for capital accumulation by dispossession. So that cannibal capitalism appears so familiar to us today, I think should be a credit to your foresight in conceiving of and assembling these essays that make up the book. So, as I read Cannibal Capitalism in preparation for tonight's event, I found myself haunted again and again by the formative rendering of capital's tendency toward cannibalization um, by the 19th century African slave turned abolitionist, Alauda Equiano. So Equiano was just haunting me every time I was going through this book. And as Nancy points out in the opening pages, there's this very cruel irony, actually, by which the progenitors of cannibal capitalism in Europe inverted the logic of their own model of accumulation. So they were condemning Africans as savage and cannibalistic in these centuries-long efforts to exploit African labor power, as well as to expropriate landed resources in the circumatlantic world. So you know, this is what we understand to be the foundational surplus of the plantation economy. This is what Marx glosses simply as you know, the secret of so-called primitive accumulation. But Equiano, and this is in his autobiography in 1789, um, the interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Equiano, offers a, another entry point into this epic of cannibal capitalism. So Equiano begins, he recounts his life before capture, his bondage at the hands of slave traders, um, his, the trauma of the Middle Passage, where, where he's carried to the West Indies and later to the American mainland. But when the slave ship makes its landing in Barbados, he makes us privy to his distinct fears of cannibalism. So it's a, it's a quote from Equiano. He says, many merchants and planters now came on board, though it was in the evening. They put us in separate parcels and examined us attentively. They also made us jump and pointed to the land, signifying we were to go there. We thought that by this we should be eaten by these ugly men as they appeared to us. They told us we were not to be eaten but to work. So standing from the perch of the auction block, Equiano and his African comrades in cargo understood that they stood at the threshold of a profoundly cannibalistic enterprise. They were told that they were not to be eaten, but you know, putting Nancy's pithy definition to work for ourselves today of cannibal capitalism as a societal order that empowers a profit-driven economy to prey on the extra economic supports it needs to function it's clear that Equiano understood quite well that his body and those of enslaved Africans function in the cruel imagination of planter capital, not as a source of free labor to exploit, but precisely as an extra economic support drawn from outside these metropolitan theaters that Marx took to be paradigmatic, the, the factories in, in Manchester. So where Marx, and this is one of my favorite quotes, where Marx looked at capital as an occulted or vampire-like form, right, that sucks surplus from its laboring base, Equiano turned instead to the cannibal as the figuration of his bondage. Um, so the threat of cannibalism does persist beyond the auction block, and I promise this is going to be crucial to my questions, that as he's conscripted on, into service on a merchant ship, Equiano makes friends with a, a free white shipmate named Richard Baker. 
and the difference in his racial and juridical status doesn't shield Richard from the cannibalistic overtures of the ship's captain. So we see this cannibal metaphor um, emerge again. Equiano says, the captain used to tell Richard jocularly that he would kill and eat me. Sometimes he would say to me, the black people were not good to eat, and would ask me if we did not eat people in my country. I said no. Then he said he would kill Dick, as he always called him, first, and afterwards me. So this scene is really telling, I think, in the way that it presages both the extractive structures and class antagonisms of today, right? So Equiano and Baker are apprehended as two distinct forms of labor, you know, one unfree, one free, one dead labor, the other living labor. Yet both of them are equally subject to this cannibalistic force of the ship's captain. Um, in Nancy's terms, Equiano and Baker embody the two basic forces of cannibal capitalism, so that's expropriation and exploitation, that are rendered as ontologically distinct, that they are seen as two different classes of labor, when in fact they are laboring side by side on the ship's deck. So they are in fact materially and genealogically linked. So I rehearse all of this to suggest that there are actually many Equianos and many Bakers to be found today. You know, sometimes we gloss this as racial capitalism, I have my own sort of appreciation and critiques of that category, but I think it sort of represents more than anything the continued re relevance of race to these repertoires of capital accumulation. Um, one of the critical problems I think that Nancy is giving voice to facing us today is the ability of Equiano to apprehend the threat appropriately, you know, while this nominal status of freedom obscures how his friend Richard Baker also is conscripted into this matrix, I mean, albeit unevenly. So what I appreciate most about your book, actually, is your insistence that contemporary social theory, as well as socialism, dares to catch up with Equiano, right, and his 18th century treatise on cannibal capitalism. So with Equiano in mind, I think this is where I'll turn to my questions as they pertain to our political present. Um, first, in a sort of crude simplification, I might ask sort of, is the prim primary audience for cannibal capitalism the children of Equiano or the children of Baker? And I'm being a bit cheeky here, but in other words, there are many who already encounter capital as cannibal-like, perhaps rather than vampire-like in their lived experience of abandonment, necropower, you know, thinking, again, as you said, the, the subwork, the wageless, the wretched. Is the aim then to convince Baker, you know, who Equiano claimed as a genuine and lifelong friend, to cast his lot with Equiano against the allure of the wages of whiteness or whatever other sort of name we give to that structure. Um, how perhaps does this assist us as we try to resolve this artificial division that you um, sort of diagnose quite astutely between human beings and non-human nature, right? Um, I think that also lends itself to the other question I have on um, sort of political will and the praxis of socialism. Um, this is where you turn us to in the penultimate chapter of the book. Um, and I guess I'd really love for you to elaborate on the content of this socialist vision as a remedy for cannibal capitalism. So it's one that necessarily understands the fates of Equiano and Baker to be interlocking, um, and also the necessity not simply to negotiate these kind of timely compromises between labor and capital, but to actually unsettle its basic mechanics, right? To unsettle the ship or sort of um, shake the ship itself. Um, namely, what we see now in the pursuit of, you know, mineral and hydrocarbon reserves of fossil power and new reserve armies of labor power. So I say this, you know, as you, as you left us with Nancy, that you know, what often passes for socialism today in the form of you know, welfare capitalism, taxing the rich, redistribution measures, other kinds of band-aid reforms, seems to actually be unfit for the task that you've laid out here. So I guess I'll, I'll end by asking sort of how might the grammar of cannibal capitalism travel and compel us to adopt that new critical vocabulary that we need, um, and perhaps a new political horizon as well that goes beyond the social democracy that often masquerades as socialism today. So I'll leave it there. Nancy, Fantastic. I would love to hear you th Fantastic. you know your thoughts on these things. <laughs> Although Ryan, what what a great comment. So rich, so interesting. 
So let, let me start with Equiano and Baker. That's a, a really uh, lovely framing of this problem. Um, I'm going to start with just a, a, a technical definition, and then I want to get to the more human and political uh, issue here. Um, I understand um, exploitation in uh, Marx's terms, meaning that capital pays the worker for the worker's necessary labor time. That is, the, for the hours in which the worker produces a sum of value sufficient to cover the worker's own living costs, the reproduction of the, the worker as an individual or under better conditions, the worker's family. Uh, and then the capitalist takes the rest, surplus value, et cetera. Expropriation, and, and uh, oh, that, that's the sort of one aspect of the de definition. The second aspect, is the um, idea of the labor contract that the, the worker is considered to be the, the owner of the worker's own labor power, able to dispose of it. He or she can sell it to any capitalist that they want. Of, of course, the hitch is, Marx always says, that worker is doubly free, meaning uh, they're not only free to sign the contract, but they don't have any choice about it because they have been freed of any access to the means of life and the means of labor, right? Okay, that's how I understand exploitation. I understand expropriation as different on both of those points. I understand it uh, first because in this case, capital does not pay the full reproduction costs. The, capital may not actually pay anything or maybe it, uh, it, it pays a little bit and maybe it doesn't pay it to the actual worker, but to somebody else who's, you know, the owner of the worker or whatever. Um, but in any case, you're, you're, you're not even getting your necessary labor hours compensated, let alone the others. And, and, and in addition, you don't have that status of the free individual who can sign, you are bound to the land, to some kind of a, a master, whether we're talking about chattel slavery or some form of serfdom or debt bondage or uh, you know, sharecropping, whatever, some sort of way in which you are really stuck. You're not mobile. So um, there's been a lot of interesting uh, discussion about how free really is even the free worker, which I think is what part of what your story is getting at. Um, and, you know, people have, have, have shown all the ways in which he, that, that's not much in the way of actual freedom. And yet, how could we say that these guys are in the same boat? That, that's, so we have to avoid these two extreme positions, right? On the same boat. <laughs> On the same boat. Good point. Okay. I stand correct. On but not in. In, in but not of, or whatever Mark says, yeah. Okay, um, so, so I want to say, first of all, that to become a citizen worker and be merely exploited is actually an achievement. This was not the case for all sorts of nominally free majority ethnic workers in England, in the United States. People had to organize and fight tooth and nail to be merely exploited, to slough off the trappings of expropriation, to, to actually get those hours uh, that cover there. Uh, so it's an achievement, and it's an uneven achievement. And I think what's happening today is that some people who did make that achievement are actually losing some of it, are finding that in, in at least some sense of expropriation, they're being paid less than the cost of their reproduction. So there's, I think we're seeing this, these kind of hybrid figures that are exploited and expropriated, even as there is what Du Bois called the, the you know, that, that dark mass of proletarians uh, around the globe who remain expropriated, pure and simple. Um, now, I want to say uh, about the politics of all of this, um, 
I have been very um, influenced by Du Bois in Black Reconstruction by the idea that the United States had two labor movements, trade unionism and abolition, that the whole history of the country would have looked very different if they had actually understood themselves as fellow labor movements and found a way to cooperate, which they did not. Um, and now here's where I want to complicate your ship. I guess ships in, in those days were all male. But um, we, we have some other workers that we have to put into this story. We, we, have, to, we have to talk about the enslaved women who were right, coerced into breeding more slaves. We have to talk about the free women uh, uh, whose husbands were in the factories and didn't earn enough and had to take up sex work on the side and so on. Um, so that was sort of my, my thought about Du Bois was, um, yeah, two labor movements. But why stop there? Why not three? Couldn't we imagine that feminism is an unacknowledged labor movement? I'm not talking about liberal feminism exactly, um, just as you know, liberal anti-racism might not at first glance look like a labor movement. Um, so. This gets to this idea of, um, of whether people can recognize one another as not being in, in, in the same situation. These situations differ, but being victimized by the same system and having a real stake in overcoming that system. Do they have to love each other at the start? Do they? You know, probably not. Um, but um, this is how I understand the politics. So yes, Baker, Equiano, and you know the the nameless women uh, who uh, I should think of some names, but uh, whoever they are, uh, 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 who are, represent the unacknowledged third labor movement. The the ship was a, an interesting um, liminal space, um, and according to Linebaugh and Redeker, it was the, one of those scenes of the many-headed hydra where uh, all sorts of unusual alliances and, and friendships and solidarities and, and so on develop. I, I suspect that might be somewhat romanticized, I'm not sure, or certainly not representative. I think the representative story is that of division, of people clawing their way up and saying, I'm not going to be pulled back down to where you are. And that's what's so hard about the present. When people feel they are losing something, um, it's very hard to, to, for them to understand that they actually need to make common cause with people who are, have had it even worse. Uh, I think that's our, our political problem. So I would say the problem is, is less that Equiano doesn't um, recognize Baker. It, uh, well, I'm not talking about the individuals, but, but more the other way around at the moment. And um, anyway, that's, that's on socialism. Uh, that's the other thing you asked me about. OK. Um, well, I really can't say too much. You, I, I totally agree with you that social democracy is not the answer. I doubt it's, well, you know, social democracy rested on all of those social welfare measures and, and, and so on that you talked about made things better for uh, some small portion of the world's population in, in wealthy countries, but it rested on the automobile industry, for God's sake. Where did the taxes come from? It rested on fossil capitalism and on Pet, what is your uh, petro <laughs> predation or whatever? Uh, so the the imperial uh, dimension. Um, it always uh, it institutionalized women's dependency. It, it it excluded domestic workers and agricultural workers from. I mean, you know, we know all the the exclusions. This is not something we even. Here, here's what I'm saying. 
This beast is so rapacious that when you try to take away one, one uh, you know, sort of part of its meal, and, and even if you succeed in limiting its access to that, it says, okay, no worry, I'll go somewhere else and find something else to eat. Uh, the, the, you know, the world is my oyster. Uh, and, and there are lots of different oysters. So, so I, it's hard to see today uh, how we could, uh, social democracy could, would work. But I'm saying something even more provocative than that. I'm saying traditional socialism is not the answer. It's not enough to socialize ownership of the means of production. It's not enough to reorganize production. We have to rethink the whole relation between production and reproduction, between markets, if we're going to have any, and I, I believe we probably should in, in, in certain demarcated spheres, uh, and, and, and pub public power and private power. Uh, how are we going to rethink the relationship between, uh, well, expropriation shouldn't even exist at all, uh, but what, what, control over the social surplus. That's the crucial idea in my idea of socialism. The, the social surplus that we produce, if any, is the, the collective work of all of us. It doesn't, it's not an individual thing. It shouldn't accrue to anybody except to society as such. It's, a, it's collective property. And that means figuring out what to do with it. Maybe we should have less of it and we should just work less. Or maybe that we have so, so many dire needs that we need to keep working uh, a lot and, and use it uh, to meet those needs, including those needs of repair and replenishment that have just gone right unaddressed for decades and decades and decades, if not centuries. So um, to me, that's the that's the core thing is the is the question of uh, of surplus and you know and that means that and, and this whole reimagining of of what these relations are.